All right, I'm going to mute everybody, and I want to welcome our speaker, Ed Goldberg. Um, Ed brings with him a absolute wealth of knowledge from his work um, at um, Northeast Utilities. <laughs> Uh, took me a minute to remember. Um, so we're we're really delighted to have you, Ed, and looking forward. And I know you're going to do a couple more in the fall as well. So this is this is the first of several. Great, Thank thanks you. for having. Go me. Ahead. I'll go ahead and share a screen. Is that showing up? We can see it. I can see it, Ed. Okay, great. So uh, obviously we can't tell you everything there is to need, but there is to know. But I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know enough so that you can, you know, you can ask some good questions. So I guess the first question you're going to ask is, do you need a generator? And um, I had a conversation the other day, some piece of it. The the actual the actual hurricane season begins June 1st, runs to November 30th, the Atlantic hurricane season. You know, we typically get them a little later in the season, but typical isn't what's been typical the last few years by any means. Um, they're actually changing the uh, what they consider to be the average se season. First of all, they're actually um, talking now as May 15th is the start because we've had hurricanes early in the season. And the average is normally a 30-year 30 uh, 30-year average and they're updating it to be a rolling average, which means it's going to look back at the last 30 years, which means the expected uh, hurricane season is going to be a lot worse than what they expected previously. Now, that doesn't actually change the weather if you change the way you calculate the statistics, but the fact is that the statistics are based on what's actually happening. So um, the prediction should be better and um, hopefully more accurate. So, so just to make the point, how often do these things happen? Oh, these these are you know earlier in in the um, you know in the last ten years, but uh, we've had some storms that were unprecedented all along the way. So unprecedented meaning that all of a sudden we're getting these these monster storms that um, that really had. We go back to to Hurricane Gloria in 1985 until 2012, where we didn't have anything of this nature, and then it seems like they're happening all the time on a regular basis. Anybody remember Isaac from the love boat? It's Hurricane Isaac. Um, so we've had extended outages from non-hurricane events, which is the reason that, you know, we, we can't wait for the hurricane season and say, well, it's later in the season and so forth. The fact is that um, two years ago in March, we had, we had four um, back to back to back to back Northeasters that affected our service territory, Eversource service ter territory, um, formerly Northeast Utilities, as Kathleen noted. And uh, three of those had a um, you know, major outage effect on, on Connecticut. So uh, that was a, a miserable month. Judy will remember me not being around very much. I was actually up in New Britain. I, um, I myself and several other people converted a, a dormitory um, that wasn't being used into uh, housing for 1,900 out-of-state line crews, uh, and we uh, we provided linens and you know um, toiletries, and we had catering on site, and basically you know the circus comes to town. Anyway, big outage, not from a hurricane. So let's get into the generator piece of it. You have to decide for yourself whether this is a, something that you you, you know you want to do a, you know for yourself. But the simple the simple aspect is you put fuel in, electricity comes out. It's true, but I think we're going to go a little further than that today. Hopefully, um, it'll be worthwhile to you to know a little more than that. So the pictures down below, the one on the left is it's a particular brand, but there's lots of different brands out there. Generac is a common brand. And that's that's a um, – people. some people will refer to it as a whole house generator. In fact, it's not really a whole house generator, but it's a standby generator, meaning it's ready to go when – when the power goes out, it'll come on automatically and power some of your house. For some people, all of the house, it depends what you have in it. Um, you would need a very, very large generator to power everything. Um, and, and that we'll talk about that in a bit. 
And the one on the right is a portable generator. Again, a Honda, there's lots of other different brands. They all have some sort of a motor in them um, and, and they run off of different fuels. They turn the generator. Uh, you, can, you can crank it, you can pedal, you can use a hamster, but really an engine is a better way to do it. And we'll get into some of those details. And yes, you do, you put the gas in and it runs the generator. So a little background, um, there's, there's three aspects to the electricity that comes to your house by the utility company. There's generation, I think that's pretty clear. Um, you know, Millstone Station is a generating station. There's a big generating station in Montville, another one in Middletown. They're all over the place. There's also solar arrays. There's some wind power here and there. Um, and all of it goes onto the grid. The grid is transmission. Transmission of those really big power lines that you see that are usually on a defoliated right away. Um, the, locally, the easiest place to see them is they go right over from Millstone, they go right over the BJ's parking lot uh, where the, uh, the, the Regal Cinemas are and so forth. Um, those power lines <clears throat> are 345,000 volt lines, every wire that's up there, and there's quite a few wires. Um, and that's the grid. And, it, and there's places where they, they, they meet other uh, right away bulk electricity carrying towers and so forth. And somewhere that gets dropped to a substation where it becomes distribution and distribution of the poles and wires you see on your street. Some, some neighborhoods and some cities have underground utilities um, and you may see a substation. There's one down at Flanders, um, right near Costco, uh, near the entrance to Costco, um, but there's other ones all over the place. Uh, and that's basically where transmission drops off that high power and it gets stepped down for use in the neighborhood. So, that power gets delivered to the load. The load is your house or all the houses in your neighborhood or a city or a state, you know, it's a large area. Um, and one side, one side of the generator is always grounded. You, you always hear the term grounding, right? When you look at your outlet in your house, there's three wires, um, sort of a, a plus, a minus, and then there's a round one in the middle that's ground. That's a safety ground. In actuality, the, the larger of the two blades um, is, is um, well, one of the blades is, is what I call positive, if you will, one's negative. One of them is actually connected to ground, just like the safety ground. The safety ground is something that's additional and it's not factored into the, to the calculation that figures up the wire size and so forth. doesn't matter. The current flows through the wires like water through a hose and, and voltage is like the water pressure. And the pressure and the flow do the work, right? So you're, you're, your power is measured in kilowatt. Kilowatt hours is what you pay for, how much you use and for how long you use it. So for a generator, you have to have something, for, for, for a standby generator, you have to have something that's called a transfer switch. The transfer switch basically senses when power is available from the street and your house is running on street power. And when the power goes out, it switches over to the generator after it starts the generator and runs the generator for a little while so that it's stable. So basically the sequence is if you have a standby generator, when the power goes out, it usually waits somewhere around 10 seconds or so, maybe 20 seconds, and it'll start the generator. And after about 15 or 20 seconds of the generator running, it'll transfer your house from the street to the generator and the power in your house will come back on. And it's a big bang on the side of the house because it's a very large switch. I showed a picture of the inside of one of these. That's actually just like the one that's on my house. We have a standby generator here. You can also have a manual system that doesn't use a transfer switch and just has been pre-wired so that you can plug a generator into it to power your house when the power goes out. Obviously that's not gonna happen in 10 or 20 seconds, but certainly if you have a portable generator out in your garage and the house has been prepared for it and you have a cord, you can go out and start it and plug it in and you can put the power back onto your house. Just another way to do it. One of the things that people do is to do it themselves. It's very common that people make a cheater cord and they basically take a generator, you know, a little portable generator and they take a plug, they put a, a male plug on either end, which you see in the picture here, you can actually buy these online. They're incredibly dangerous because you have to plug it into something that's live and the other end of it goes into a, a socket on your house like, like for your dryer. 
and it backfeeds the power into the house. Um, you, you can start uh, fires doing this. You can burn stuff up. You can kill people. And I'll explain that in a moment. But you have to do it in the right sequence so that it doesn't backfeed, meaning you have to first turn off your, your main breaker to turn your house into a, an island, basically disconnected from the street. And then if you did this, technically it would work. It's still not the safest thing to do, but, but that's the way some people do it. What happens in many cases is backfeed. People don't disconnect their house from the street because how would you know when the power comes back on if you don't, if you don't keep uh, checking? So basically some people don't, don't really um, do it the safe way. And um, what you have on your street, you may have seen something like this, is a uh, transformer up on the pole. And that wire or wires that are up on the top, sometimes there's just one, sometimes there's three. One of those wires feeds the transformer. The other side of the transformer goes to ground. And then what comes off of that is secondary power. So the power that's fed into it from the top of your pole on the street is high voltage. It's not as high as the transmission that I mentioned earlier, but it's still thousands of volts. Goes through that transformer, gets stepped down to the 120 volt, 240 volts that gets fed to your house. Transformer is not an intelligent device. So if, you, if the power is off on the pole because of a, a, an outage and you connect the generator to your dryer outlet or somehow otherwise backfeed it into the house and don't disconnect it from the street, that 240 is gonna go out to the pole. It's gonna energize that transformer and that wire that you see on top of the pole will get energized at upwards of 13,000 volts. And if there are line crews working somewhere down the line, um, you can kill them. In fact, they, they do things to make themselves safe. They'll clamp that thing to ground before they work on it. But sometimes they'll forget or sometimes something will go wrong with the ground. The point is, while it's more likely that you'll just destroy your generator or start a fire in your house, you do have the potential to kill somebody down, down the line working on it. It's a bad thing to do. Don't backfeed. Don't do a cheater cord. Um, and that's basically what I've said here. When the power comes back on the street and the generator is connected without a, a proper transfer switch, the generator is going to be destroyed. It could blow up. It could cause electrical failure, start a fire, and so forth. So you have to choose the right generator, right? You have to figure out what you want. We'll talk about it in a minute. But generally speaking, you don't need to power everything in your house. And so an electrician can help you do a calculation or, uh, you know, anybody with uh, – with an idea of what they want to power can figure out how many kilowatts they need to come out of the generator to run everything. So a big generator like on the left, that's a nuclear plant. Um, you don't need that. That's uh, probably uh, upwards of a gigawatt, a thousand megawatts or a million kilowatts, right? Um, and on the, in the middle, um, there's a, a generator connected to a bicycle. Uh, if, if you're able to power your house with that, God bless you, but uh, probably you need something more like what's on the right, a, um, a standby generator that's appropriately sized for your home. So then the question becomes, if you decide you want to do this, do you want to do it yourself? And I'm guessing many of you are not do-it-yourselfers. Some of you are. There is some work that you can do yourself, but generally speaking, because you're connecting you know, something to your the main um, uh, incoming power from the street and the main on your... your um, you know, breaker panel, you need an electrician to do it. And you do have to pull a permit. So the electrician has to be licensed to pull the permit. Um, but they'll oftentimes work with you to let you, that's what my electrician did, was al allow me to run conduit, run the gas line, work with the gas company to do that from the, uh, from the fuel source. Um, I ordered the generator, so I got a decent deal on it. Um, I, I had a concrete pad poured, you know, brought the concrete truck in and I put in the forms and so forth. So I like to do things myself and you can do that. And a lot of people will do that, but a lot of people will rather just do turnkey, which means you hire, generally speaking, an electrician or a company in particular that sells generators and have them give you a quote for the whole thing. And when they're done, you're, you're done. You don't have to do anything. It's all, uh, it's all between them and the gas company and they'll get the permits and so forth. So what's the right size generator? What do you need to power? Um, if you have oil heat or gas heat, you generally aren't using a lot of electricity to run those, and you definitely need to have heat. So those are things you would certainly power. You probably would want to run your air conditioning if you have it for, for your house. 
If you have water pumps, sewage pumps, sump pumps, those are things you'd want to power. You want to run lights, you know, garage door openers. And these are all things that use some electricity, not a whole lot. If you use a heat pump for heat, um, sometimes there's backup electric coils that take an awful lot of power and you would probably want to run the heat pump, but not those coils. That's kind of a special case. So you'd run off the heat pump. And if it was that cold where you needed those coils, you would probably somehow get a portable heater, you know, a kerosene heater or some sort or whatever. You wouldn't want to power the coils off a generator. You, you would need an enormous generator to do that. Um, your water heater is probably a, something that you can use as a load shed. And a load shed means when the generator senses that there's too much stuff um, being turned on, it has certain things that it can turn off automatically. And a water heater is a good thing for it to be able to turn off and on as it needs it. Because when you turn the, the power off to your water heater, the hot water doesn't go out right away. You still have hot water for, could be for a day or two. Um, it could be less, but the point is you have something in the tank. And the load shed situation where too many things are on at once will probably end within a, a short while, a couple hours, and then it'll turn the water heater back on, perhaps while you're sleeping, and it'll heat up the water again. So I know you want to power everything everybody does. Um, you might want to power your electronics. You know, your if you have a pool, the pool pump so that you keep filtering the water. You may or may not want to do the dishwasher. If you do, you might want to turn the dryer cycle off so it doesn't overload the generator. I don't know if you have a trash compactor or anybody uses those anymore. Microwave is probably a good thing. The things that you don't want to power are called resistance principle devices. Things that the electricity that feeds them is its sole purpose is to make heat. So an electric oven, an electric dryer, electric baseboard heat, those heat pump backup coils I mentioned before, they all use a tremendous amount of electricity. And you have to question, you know, unless maybe you're in a restaurant business or a catering business, do you really need to, you know, have electric ovens? Are you gonna bake a cake or, or make a turkey while the power's out? Could you possibly do with something else? Maybe have a, use your cooktop, but don't, all, don't use all the burners at once. Use your microwave, use a toaster oven, use your outside grill if you have one. Those are all ways that you could still cook without overloading your generator or perhaps causing yourself to have to buy a very, very large and expensive generator. So resistance principle is basically the heat that comes off of the electricity passing through something. But in the case of pretty much anything that's powered by electricity, um, it does give off heat, but it's not the sole purpose. So things like I've shown in the picture here, a double oven or a regular oven, uh, a toaster, a, a heating baseboard, an electric dryer, an electric hair dryer, a waffle iron, those are resistance principle devices. Their sole purpose for the electricity that goes into them is making heat. And that uses a lot of electricity, um, very inefficient to do that. Um, so, so as an example, I, I, I did a little calculation. So an electric oven can use anywhere between six and 10 kilowatts. That's the size of a mid-sized mid to large size generator um, for a home. They go up to 20 kW for a home size generator. So 10 kW is, is a decent size and that's a, that'll power a decent sized house or it'll just power an electric oven, which is at the point, you, you don't wanna have to do that. And the other piece of it is, it's expensive. Running a generator is, is pretty expensive. If you're thinking about doing this instead of uh, you know, paying your electric bill, um, your, a, a, an eight kilowatt load like that oven would use about two gallons of propane an hour. And you start calculating propane at $3 an hour, and if you're cooking a turkey for eight hours, it's gonna take you $48 worth of fuel just to cook the turkey. It would make much more sense to do that in a, in a, in a gas uh, you know, grill or, or, or eat something else. <laughs> Don't eat the turkey, leave it in the freezer because you can run the freezer pretty cheap. The largest air-cooled generators are, are roughly 20 kilowatt to 22 kilowatt. And anything larger than that has to be water-cooled. So if you see these gigantic uh, generators that they have it like, uh, uh, sewage pumping stations or factories or uh, grocery stores where they, um, you know, they have a lot of freezers and so forth. They have very, very large generators. By the way, they're usually diesel. They're usually not gasoline. So fuel consumption is a, a, a factor. And you, no matter what you put in, you want to use it as little as possible to save money. I mean, it's the other thing you want to do is try and make the propane last as long as you can, assuming you're running off of propane. 
So you have to also size the tank appropriately. And a tank, a propane tank, can only be filled 80%. It needs that 20% so that the, the liquid propane evaporates into gas. That's what makes it all work. So you can get tanks that are as little as 80 gallons for a generator, and you can get up to with you know 1,000 or 2,000 gallon tanks. You, they have some underground ones. Um, they're they're a thousand a, a 500 gallon tank is roughly uh, two thousand dollars installed, um, and that's if you own it. You can lease the tanks or rent the tanks. If you do that, you have to buy your propane from the dealer that you lease it from, and they're going to charge you a much higher price for the propane than they do if you own the tank because you can shop around. I don't understand how they can get away with that, but that's that's the way the business runs, just FYI. The location of that tank. Um, uh, so first off, the generator is gonna be near your service entrance where the line comes in from the street, where your uh, meter is um, on your house, the electric meter. Um, and, and hopefully it's near the gas line. If you're putting gas in uh, propane, then you want to have it somewhere near there, um, an adequate distance from the building um, and any openings in the building. And there's code and manufacturer's specification for all that. It tells you exactly the minimum clearances and distances and so forth. Um, these generators are not particularly quiet. You know, it's like a like a large lawnmower, if you will, when it's running, even louder. And um, it gives off, uh, you know, a little bit of exhaust, uh, some heat, and it needs to be serviceable. So you need to be able to get to it. If you're living down near the beach, you want this to be, or anywhere else that floods, you want it to be above the flood level so they can put it up. And they're not ugly, but it's a box. It's like an air conditioning compressor that you have outside. So you have to consider that too. Um, and, and so all those considerations go into where you want it and so forth. I like <laughs> installations where the tank is away from the house and then it's plumbed underground, but that, that's not a code requirement. You can put the tank right up next to the house. Lots of people do. A lot of people use propane for heat. A lot of people use it for cooking. Um, the other option is, of course, if you have a gas service, if you, uh, in our area, I think Yankee Gas Service is most of the area, like in, this, in the city, um, that's a great option. Obviously, if there's an outage of gas, while there's an electric outage, then you're out of luck, but it's pretty un unusual. Um, you know, I, Eversource delivers both, and um, I can't remember a time when they were both out. Okay, now that I've said that, um, something will prove me wrong perhaps, but hopefully not. Um, they're usually white, just consider that if you want, you know, you can paint it or cover it or landscape it and so forth. Get a permit, I said that before. One of the nice things about the permit is it engages the building officials who have to come out and inspect it. And, and they're good people. They, they don't want to see you get hurt. They don't want to see a hazardous um, installation. And so they're, they're actually one of your best friends when all this goes on. So you want to make sure that whoever does it pulls the permit to make it legal. And uh, the inspector will actually be quite helpful in that regard. They make sure that it's done right. Um, ordering the generator, you know that you probably see them. They sell them at Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, you can buy it from, from anybody. One of the best sites just for shopping and comparing, I, I've bought stuff from them, electric, electricgeneratorsdirect.com. Um, they have lots and lots of information on there. You go on there, you can learn at least as much as you're learning from this tonight. Uh, I, I would uh, highly recommend it. It's pretty good. Um, and even if you do a turnkey installation, if you go and just poke around on there, you'll see pictures, you'll get information, and you'll be a smarter consumer. <clears throat> Generators are very big. They're very heavy. The ones, ones for your house anyway, you know, a standby generator. Um, so they're drop shipped generally from a manufacturer via motor freight. So that means a big truck like a tractor trailer is going to drop it off at the end of your driveway. Um, so whoever's doing the installation will take care of that. Uh, they may have it delivered to their facility and then take it from there. In any case, if you decide you're doing some of this yourself, just be aware of that. And they're not going to usually have a lift gate unless you pay to have a lift gate. Um, if that's an option. Um, so they're looking for a loading dock or for your biggest, strongest, best friends to help get it off the truck and down onto the ground. So a 20 kilowatt generator, which is generally the largest you would use for a house, weighs around 700 pounds in the crate. Um, and they do provide for you to carry it. They have uh, actually, most of them have holes where you can put a, a, you know, like a one inch iron gas pipe that you can, you can buy and, and return at Home Depot or Lowe's. And they go through two slots and then you can pick it, pick it up and carry it like Cleopatra's litter. 
that's what they call those carriage carriages that the soldiers carry here around on so you can you can have a little party uh when when it's time to install it or move it so the brands um the most popular brand is generac doesn't mean that they're the best or the most durable nothing like that at all they're just uh you know they're good at marketing they're probably very profitable that's why lots of people cut, carry them um they're they're fine there's nothing wrong with them no particular order there's kohler cummins onan uh, briggs and stratton general electric briggs and stratton used to brand label for ge they may still do that there's others around um consumer reports rates them usually has briggs and stratton and if there's a GE one that's equivalent, they're usually rated pretty high, but they're all good. And that changes, you know, from, from each model and year to year. They're generally serviced by uh, the portable ones are generally serviced by small engine repair shops, kind of like lawnmowers, um, advanced uh, power equipment in, in East Lyme is one. I think Johnson's and Groton uh, services, things like that. Um, some of them uh, will serve as lawnmowers, but not generators. Um, and you may have to look, but generally speaking, the manufacturers of these have a, a, a list in their, in their manual that they provide, or at least online, where you can take it for service. Permanently installed generators are serviced by dealers who specialize in home and small business generators. And they're more like a car engine. You know, it's a little bigger. Um, so repairs and maintenance are done on site. They don't take the generator into the shop. Um, some dealers won't service installations by others, but generally every manufacturer does have a network of service providers. So you, you can look there and you can find someone who's familiar with that product and, and uh, get some good service on it. Um, as far as service, um, they're pretty, pretty reliable um, and pre pretty uh, durable. Um, you can go years, with, with, certainly without having any problems, uh, um, in many years. Um, they do require oil changes, you know, oil and filter and air filters and, and spark plugs from time to time. Um, just like a, like a car, but uh, they'll do it right on, on site and it isn't particularly expensive and uh, it doesn't have to be all that often. The oil changes do have to be done often. I'll talk about that. So different kinds of fuel, you can run them on gasoline, propane, natural gas, or diesel. So d natural gas is what comes out of the pipe that comes into your house if you have gas uh, service. Propane are those tanks. Um, Gasoline is generally for the portable ones. You don't usually have ja gasoline powered um, standby generators connected to the house because that would imply that you have to store the gasoline. Gasoline doesn't store well. Um, it breaks down after a month or two. You can put stabilizer in it that'll extend that, but it's still a bad practice to use old gasoline. Um, diesel fuel is what the large ones run on and most uh, commercial facilities use diesel fuel. Natural gas, again, comes from the gas company out of a pipe into your house. Um, gas and propane, uh, natural gas and propane don't deteriorate. Um, so you can have store uh, propane for a long, long time. The only thing that would, would deteriorate would be the gas, the tank itself. Diesel fuel um, has to be, is, is easily stored, but it has to be maintained. So if you have a, a commercial business you know, with a large generator and it's running off of diesel, um, whoever's doing it needs to service the diesel fuel. There's, uh, there's additives that have to be put into it. Sometimes you have to actually take it up, take it out uh, and filter it and put it back or, or use it up and refresh it every few years. Um, it, it grows fungus and it grows all kinds of other stuff. So they, they put additives in it. Um, so it's not something that you probably won't have to worry about. Again, I mentioned earlier, it's not a cost effective way uh, to, to, to make power. So it, as an alternative to commercial power, it's very, very expensive. So don't consider that you're going to do this. I figured 250 a day here. Um, if, we, if you have a 20 kilowatt generator, that's the largest you can have for a home and you're running, running it under full load, which isn't a, isn't a good idea and it's not likely anyway. That's a lot of power. Um, but that would use upwards of 75 gallons a day, right? So a um, lot, lot of propane, a lot of money. They require maintenance. Consider that a, that a generator, a gas generator, propane generator, generally they run at 3,600 RPM. If you drive your car around town, you're running at, you know, 2,000. Maybe if you beat on it, maybe it'll get to 3,000, but you probably don't leave it there for long. If you get on the highway, if it's a big engine, it'll run at 2,000. If you get in a small car, 2,500. Of course, if you go really fast, it's going to go faster. But, but rarely does it get up around 3,600 RPMs. 
these are running at 3,600 RPMs all the time. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or until you shut it down. You really do need to change the oil every 100 hours. So if you're running it like that for four, four days straight during a prolonged outage, you probably want to have someone service it. And you can, you can have someone, you can do it yourself if you know how to do it. Not hard to do, it's just changing the oil. Um, and you should always check the oil level because they do use oil at 3,600 RPM. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough assignment for a small engine, but that's, that's the way these are made. I, I mentioned the, uh, a little while ago, um, load shed, I talked about the hot water heater. So you could design a load, for, you know, figure out what the load is for your house and buy a generator based on running everything all at once. That'll be a very large generator. In all likelihood, it's smarter to figure that not everything's going to be on all at the same time. Um, and, and you can control that and be careful of it. And it doesn't hurt anything if it has the ability to shed load, meaning it could drop something out when it sees too much of the load on, on itself. So the, the person that installs it, um, there's instructions on how to wire these up. Most of the generators come in today with a transfer switch and they have the, the intelligence to be able to protect themselves and turn things off as needed. Most generators that are installed on a permanent basis run a self-test once a week for about 20 minutes. That's enough for it to warm up. It does it without you having to do anything. And uh, mine runs every Tuesday at three o'clock, runs for 20 minutes, shuts off. And uh, if there's a problem with it at any time, um, there's different ways they can tell you. Some of them are connected to the internet and you'll get an email or a text message. Some of them have a little, uh, a little light that gets installed, you know, wherever you want, put it, put it in your kitchen or, your, you know, somewhere where it'll be noticed and the light will blink if something's wrong. And otherwise it just stays on steady to show you that it's ready. Um, some of them even have little, little L LCD screens that, that are like little, you know, smart screens and you can get all kinds of information off them with, with buttons and menus and so forth. You could rent a generator if you needed it. The problem is when you need a generator, typically so does everybody else. And so they'll be hard to get. You could contract with someone who rents generators so that you have priority or that so that you're guaranteed that you'll have one when available. Each of those options costs more and more. So to be guaranteed that there's one available, consider that they have to have at least enough generators for all the customers to whom they've made that promise. So that's an expensive proposition for them. They're going to pass it along and then add some profit to it. Um, and what you see in front of you is, uh, is, is a typical, it's a pretty good size generator, maybe bigger than what you need for a house, but maybe you have a small business and that's one way that you consider it. You have to have the, ho the house or the business pre-wired so that when it comes in, it's ready to go. And you have to get a contract with somebody to make sure that you have it when you need it. Commercial installation, same thing, turnkey and service from a good deal, just like a home one. Um, maintenance has to include fuel maintenance if you're, if you're doing diesel um, and management of supply chain issues, meaning what if when the power's out, they can't deliver more fuel when you need it and you're really not, not in good shape. Um, for electronics, um, just be aware that uh, you know, in your house, you might have a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, or at least a good surge suppressor for your TV, your computers, um, things of that nature that, that might be damaged from a transient, from a, from a, a over or under voltage situation. Um, it's good to protect anyway, but if you're running a generator, it's a good idea to, to have that equipment in place. For a commercial installation, you absolutely have to have it, um, especially if it's old, like you're powering a data center or something. Um, the portable units run on diesel because propane is hard to transport, okay? So if you go... Uh, over the George Washington Bridge or through the tunnels in New York. Those are the closest things to here, or Boston even. They usually have signs saying that if you have, if you have uh, propane or other hazardous loads, that there's a certain route you have to take. And it's usually not the most convenient. Um, and again, the building needs to be wired and uh, maintenance and fueling taken care of. That's what I've got for today. So, so I wanted to leave time for questions. Um, Thank you, Ed. I'll, I'll kick it off by asking a question. Um, the, um, it's my understanding that number two, fuel oil and diesel are the same thing. So if you're heating your house with fuel oil, can you use the same tank to, to uh, provide fuel to both the generator and your house? 
Um, you'd have to ask the fuel distributor. The problem is the quality of the fuel and the, the issues I mentioned, you know, so you have a, a 275 or a 550 gallon tank in your house of, of number two, two fuel. It's not treated to run through an engine. You know, just like um, wow. it tends to be dirtier. It might have uh, mold in it. I mean, have you ever had, all the years you've had your furnace, have you ever had someone come in and, turn, and, and clean or treat your tank? you know, where the, where the uh, heating fuel is stored? Uh, probably not, right? And, and the, the fuel that comes out of the pump for uh, automobiles at the, at the um, gas station that's diesel, that diesel fuel has been treated differently than the number two heating fuel. The number two heating fuel is cheaper, right, than diesel. Although they, they don't tax diesel if it's being used for a generator or, or for heat. Hey, Bruce. Hi. Uh, hi, Ed. And thank you very much for the talk. I really, I really enjoyed it. It's very, very interesting. Uh, the question I had um, uh, uh, involves something a little bit, a little bit different. Um, back in the late 1800s, there was a solar storm from the sun. And that storm was a very, very uh, big event. It knocked out um, uh, 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 transmission wires for uh, for the uh, Morse code and things like that. Uh, if that if that event happened to, happened today, it happened about a hundred years ago. Uh, if that a little more than hundred years ago, if that if that event happened today, uh, it could knock out most of the electrical grid. Is um, are the are the electrical companies trying to design? Uh, ways to harden the grid to prevent solar storms like happened over 100 years ago. And it's going to happen again because they do happen from time to time. Uh, are the electric companies doing something about that to try to harden their, their grid against such solar storms? Yeah. So they've been doing stuff for decades. Um, and it's not just solar storms <laughs> that they worry about. Solar storms are common. Um, of varying intensity, right? And they get some advance warning on most of them. That's one of the nice things about solar storms. They're, 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 like, they're like weather, they can predict them and so forth. Um, not just, you know, like immediately, like, you know, in, in an hour or two, but also what the trend is. You know, it's, it generally uh, follows the sunspot cycle, which is an 11 year cycle. Um, but they, um, yeah, they, they've hardened a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of the transmission system is hardened. Um, and uh, what they worry about is um, large current in the transformers, the big transformers, because because the what the solar storm does is it, it induces current in anything that's metal, and and in particular anything that's in a loop, so that it can flow current through it. Right? It'll drive current through everything. It'll drive current through you know stuff in your car. It'll drive current through the grid. It'll drive current through um, those transformers, and the transformers are actually just coils of wire, large coils of wire that, that are used to set up a magnetic field. So it's a magnetically induced, electromagnetically induced current. The, um, the bigger concern, and you may have read about this um, um, back when the rhetoric was, was flying around between the United States and North Korea, is over an electromagnetic pulse, which is like a solar storm, except it's concentrated of a much higher um, uh, intensity and uh, they've actually done protection for that as well. Not enough. They're still working on it. It's very expensive to really make everything as hard as it could be. But for the solar storms, they've gotten pretty good at that. So what, what was, what's the most likely scenario is there'd be some damage. It wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be um, catastrophic in nature, but it would trip stuff on offline, protective devices and so forth. And a lot of stuff would have to be reset by hand later on, um, kind of like fuses, if you will, um, but they're a lot faster acting. Um, but there'd be some damage. And, and of all that, the thing that's most debilitating, it's not the wires, it's, it's the transformers, and it's not the little transformers we have on our street, because there's warehouses with those and there's places where they're stored and it's relatively shielded and so forth. The big worry is the big transformers that they have like at the substations I mentioned before. And the ones that basically interconnect the grid, they're all over the country, right? And when they get destroyed, 
there's no spares or there's limited spares and they're very, very long lead time items, say somewhere from one to three years to have one made because there's, there's hardly any companies that make them and very, very few in the United States. So that's a big problem. That's something to worry about. There's actually a committee, um, the, the Edison Electric Institute that um, uh, puts together between all the utilities working on things like that. And um, I actually was involved with that committee. I was the chair of the business continuity uh, committee for Edison Electric Institute for the whole country. And uh, it, it's, it's definitely a worry. So you, you hit it on the head. There's a couple books out there. There's been some movies. Some of them are very, very exploitative. You know, they're alarmist and so forth. So, you know, the truth lies somewhere in between. If a utility says, don't worry, we got it covered, or the book says everything's going to go down the toilet, it's somewhere in between is where okay. it really was. Yeah, very great interesting. Question. Thank you very sure. much. Sure. Um, I got Ira and then, and then uh, doesn't look like Carla, but we'll call on him anyway. First, thank you very much, Ed. And I'm not sure if you covered it, but you might tell people never run a portable generator indoors like a garage. Yeah, good point. That's one of the reasons that the instructions always tell you, not only not in the garage, don't put it near an opening into the building. So for the permanently installed one, that's easy because once you put it in, it's in the right place. But yeah, the portable one, very good point. Um, when there's a storm com coming, um, Eversource sends out messages to all of it. You may get phone calls, you may get emails, depends what you're subscribed to, text message and so forth. And the safety information they provide there and on the website always includes that. Plus the thing I mentioned about, you know, not backfeeding, um, but generally all the safety involved with the, with the generator. A lot of people die that way too, Ira. You're, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Carla? <laughs> Hi, Ed. Thank you very much for calling on me. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I was uh, impressed and awed by your talk. I have a whole bunch of questions. I can't get them all now. But one question I had in terms of what you just mentioned about those pieces of equipment that require the long lead time, do you know about Ted Koppel's book, Lights Out? Have you read that? Is that alarmist? To me, it was alarming, but I didn't think it was irrationally alarmist. Um, and it speaks about the possibility both of an EMP as well as, and this is something I saw on TV years ago where there was some signal, it was a test of the vulnerability of the grid, and there was some signal sent and some piece of electri electrical equipment vibrated like crazy and then blew up. So my first question is, is Koppel's book, do you think that's alarmist um, or? No, so, so I got one of the first copies <laughs> several years back, quite a few years back when it came out and we had lots of discussion on that, right? Um, and uh, if you're so interested, before I forget, there's a book called Powering Through. It's available on Amazon. I, I'm gonna say it's paperback. I don't know how much it costs. Powering Through, and this is the second edition. So the new edition just came out this year. Um, and um, it covers electric magnetic pulse and the grid uh, vulnerability and so forth in, in much greater detail than, than his book or, or it, it, every possible aspect of it is, is covered. Um, and chapter three um, is, I'm, I'm one of the authors in chapter three, coincidentally. Um, so, so it's a great book. And then um, uh, as far as uh, alarmist, Mm, you know, a little bit maybe because, you know, you just have to consider what the likelihood of all the things happening are. Um, but, but one of the issues, so I forget his name now, um, Thomas something, he was the chairman of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And uh, uh, he, he, he resigned probably back around 2015. I'm, I'm winging it here. He was, he was quoted in Koppel's book and in other places. And what he did was when he retired, what they all do, they go into consulting, you know, very high price consulting, right? And so the first thing he did was he gave some speeches where he not only talked about the vulnerabilities, he actually listed nine substations um, in the United States that if you took those out, you would do the most damage to the grid. Oh, thank you very much. Right. So we all said, why, why, why would he do that? Uh, well, we know why he did it, so that he can further his consulting career. However, um, it's not entirely accurate, right? Because they, they, they do have spares and so forth. 
and there is microgrids. You've heard of that, where basically if the if the grid comes undone, you start building it back together piece by piece, and you start to bring up whatever you can, and then you tie it together later. So a lot of stuff will run not tied together, but it's more reliable when it's tied together. So the nature of the grid is uh, that it is very reliable because it's so so much stuff tied together. What you saw in Texas a uh, month before last, was it? Where they had lots of outages. So there's uh, North America consists of um, the Eastern interconnect and the Western interconnect. And, um, and even those are tied together, but not, not really in a grid-like way. Um, and it's basically, I, I think like, like the Mississippi is the midpoint, but I'm not really sure there's some, there's some latitude to that. And the third grid in North America is Texas. So Texas is not connected to the Eastern interconnect or the Western interconnect, which is all the other states. They're on their own. So they have to manage within Texas, the balance between load and the generation capacity that's available. If, when you're managing the grid, if those two ever go out of, out of uh, balance, then you either have not enough load and the generators will start to speed up or, or you know, protection, protective equipment will pre prevent that from happening. Or if you overload it, not enough generation, then it'll start to slow down. And that's where you get blackouts because you start to have cascading uh, um, load shedding. Um, Texas went it alone for the, because they don't want federal regulation. If you don't have wires that cross state lines, you're not subject to federal regulation. It's a Texas mentality, I and mean, it's pure and simple, and that goes back a long way. And they paid the price for that recently. And it's something that we all knew could happen, but it never did. And this was a, they were in a you know, tough situation because of the weather and, and so forth that, that you know, exacerbated it. Um, so anyway, we've been all over the place. Was that helpful? Uh, it, it, helpful and impressive. Obviously, uh, we could have guessed that Judy wouldn't have married an unsmart guy. Thank you, Ed. Well, she's very smart for marrying me. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Even if I don't know the answer, I'll make stuff up. It's fun. Well, oh, I have a Bruce. comment. Uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. And then Bruce will go. Go ahead, Kathleen. Kathleen Frozen. Okay, Bruce. I think you might be muted, Bruce. I don't know. So can, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, um, the uh, electrical system, uh, is it uh, as, um, similar to what happened to that uh, uh, gasoline pipeline that uh, got shut down because of a ransomware? Could that happen to the electrical system? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, cyber attacks are, are very common. Um, and I was involved in the protective end of it within Eversource, but also nationally. So, so the couple interesting things that they do, um, they work co closely with a lot of the government partners, right? The FBI, Department of Homeland Security, um, FERC and, and NERC and uh, uh, EISAC, uh, the Electrical uh, inform, um, sorry, Infrastructure Sector. They, it's basically a, a, um, a fusion center that monitors anything that could affect the electrical sector. And if you look at Homeland Security has about 20 sectors that include, you know, uh, water systems, uh, fuel systems, hospitals, uh, you know, all the different critical infrastructure that, that the country um, uh, needs. And electrical is a separate sector. And so um, there's some, some people that do that. There's also some, some pooling of resources. So a utility like Eversource, has firewalls, has a, a, a large investment in IT security and so forth. The systems that run the grid, um, uh, <clears throat> control systems and so forth, supervisory control systems uh, that, that, that do switching and things like that, they tend to be on a separate network, not connected to the internet for security reasons. Doesn't mean that someone couldn't somehow get into it, but it's very, very, very difficult. And uh, it, it, it happened in the Ukraine. Um, it has happened here maybe once in a couple of different places. I think there was an incident up in Vermont 
Um, but it was a single switching incident. It wasn't a widespread event. But still, I, I always caveat, it doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. Um, one of the things that they, they did was a, uh, several years back, we, um, we worked with the national, the, the, the national labs, Brookhaven and Pacific Northwest and uh, Idaho Falls. And you know, there's these uh, the energy labs all over the country that uh, you know, over the years they've done different things. Each one's a specialist in different, different aspects of heuristics and, and uh, cybersecurity and so forth. Well, what they did was they actually came up with a device that monitors all the, the traffic on the internet that goes in and out of every utility. Now, only the utilities that want to participate do. They have to pay for it. Um, and the, the government, if you will, these, these energy labs, are only looking at the envelope. So if you're familiar with how the internet works, the internet works off of packets. They're like envelopes. So each envelope has information about where it came from, where it's been, and where it's going. And then the data resides inside the envelope. Of course, it's not physical. It's all ones and zeros, right? They're not interested in, in the, the content of the envelope. They're just interested in the envelope because they want us, they want to know when there's a whole bunch of traffic coming from China or from Iraq or, or, or Iran or North Korea that's going to utility control systems. Um, and they monitor for that. And, and generally speaking, they can alarm and, and, and shut it down in no time. Um, but it's also investigative and it, it builds the level of security to a point where so far so good, it's, it's working. It's a cat and mouse game, purely. It never stops. They're always trying to come up with something that'll get in and we're always trying to come up with ways that'll block it. Yeah. That's the bottom line. But it's pretty right, sophisticated, okay. pretty expensive. There's a lot of money spent on that. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, Dan. Uh I forgot to ask, could somebody who would have flunked college physics if his professor hadn't been kind, could he, could he understand powering through or is it heavily technical? No, it's not heavily technical at all. Um, and it's got source resources and source information sort of in a scholarly manner. So it's, you know, it's uh, sort of peer reviewed in, in that way. It's not, it's not completely peer reviewed, but it's largely so. Um, so that if you want to, if something interests you and you want to dig deeper, you can, you can, you know, follow the links and go to deeper stuff. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward as far as the level that it's presented at. Okay, thank I'll you. I'll give you an example. They gave copies to everybody in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have such a way with words. <laughs> yeah, so, so the meeting that we have every year in preparing that book uh, it's an ongoing thing. It's not just the book, but it's also all the other information and the, the, um, the progress that they've made in, in, you know, putting in protection. Um, it's usually held at the Capitol. We've had it in the, the Senate, um, not in the Senate. There's a Senate, like, a, like an auditorium attached to the Senate, and there's one for the House. And it's basically for guests, you know, and, uh, and they all come and speak, lots of them. But, the, <laughs> but their talks are really, you know, I, I, you know, when it's over is when the real work starts. But it's nice that they're, that they're noticing the work. Thank you again. Sure. Yeah, just, just a thank you. Just a comment. Um, I thought it was a really interesting talk, and I just wish I had heard it about five years ago. Um, my husband bought a uh, generator that isn't uh, synced in, so it doesn't start automatically, and it has all the problems you talked about. I mean, you know, it's kind of complicated to go out there and figure out, you know, remember all the steps for turning it on. And plus, you buy all this gas, and then you have to get rid of it because you, you can't keep it. So I, I do wish we had gone the other way. I have transfer envy, I guess. <laughs> sure. Envy. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, Ed, how, how much is, you know, I know it's not a whole house generator, but that's what we all call it. What's the price range on those? So a 20 kilowatt, which is the largest, you know, air cooled, typical for a house generator um, with a transfer switch, typically about $6,000, you know, on the end of your driveway. Um, and probably another few thousand to, you know, pour a pad, run the conduit, hire the electrician, probably in the $10,000 range right. for, for a large unit. 
that'll really, uh, you know, do all your needs within the house. You can go, I, I, you know, like one of my neighbors has one that's, I think, 10 kW. So they're probably, they're not half the price, but they're probably several thousand less. Mm -hmm. All right. Good to know. Yeah. I mean, even concrete's expensive now. Everything's, you know, the, we're starting to see the, the beginning of some pretty good inflation. Yeah. Seema. Is she frozen? Yeah, Ed, thank you so much. Um, we, we, we bought a, a generator um, back some seven years ago, I guess. And it's an 11 uh, kilowatt. And it really does everything that, that uh, we had wanted from it. Yeah. I, I think what we did was pass on the air conditioning okay. because we figured we were really interested in electricity and heating. Sure. So uh, that reduced what we thought we needed. But, but you have provided me with something new to worry about. Now, all of those, all of those um, terminals that are gonna take a year or two to uh, come back online. The transformers? I, yeah. I, I wouldn't worry, don't lose any sleep over it. I mean, um, they, they have, uh, Step is a, um, the Edison Electric has associated all the electric companies and it's called the Spare Transformer Equipment Program. In the event of a terror attack that attacks, you know, some part of the grid or a single utility, or whatever, they have an inventory of the transformers that exist. Everybody has some spares, but nobody has spares for everything. But between all of them, they share. And I, I'll give you an example. Some years back at Millstone, one of the, um, primary transformer, output transformers at the station um, needed to be replaced, I think at, at um, Plymouth Nuclear Plant up in, um, in, in it's actually uh, Pilgrim in, in Plymouth, uh, Mass. Mm -hmm. And we loaned them ours, uh, you know, our spare. And then when they got one in, they brought it back to us. And this is not a little transformer. This has to go on a barge and then on a truck that has about 150 wheels on it, like a caterpillar. It's really pretty cool if you ever get to see one, but you probably won't. Anyway, um, they do as much of it on the water. And then, so it's a massive unit. It, it weighs millions of pounds. You can, you can never take it over the road. It'll, it'll destroy any road, any bridge that it went over. But, oh. uh, but they have a way to get them around. And they, they brought it up there and they got them back in business. And then within, uh, I want to say it was probably a year, they got another one made and they brought it back to us. All right, so I'll defer that worry for a little while. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. Yes, we're all in it together. <laughs> Thank anyway. you. Sure. Thank you, Red, for a fantastic, fascinating talk. Really My enjoyed pleasure. It. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was uh, really wonderful. We really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, obviously, you, you know so much about this topic, and it really came through. So thank you. So at the end of the presentation, so, you know, the, you recorded it, but as a matter of convenience, I presented this maybe uh, seven or eight years ago, and that presentation is also out on YouTube, and there's a link to it on the last slide or the second to last slide that I presented tonight. So if anybody has access to this recording, they can just go in there and see that, and then you can go back to that one, and that one, uh, it's pretty, pretty much the same thing. Great to know. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Really appreciate. We look forward to your next one. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.